because he's projecting his own, um, you know, helplessness as a child onto the larger culture. You know, he 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 hates the the big daddy now. You know, the Uncle Sam daddy, and. Once again, I'm not suggesting or suggesting that. And that's always been sort of a kind of a ridiculous critique, I've thought, because if my father would have been perfect, 90 percent of the large fish in the oceans would still be gone, and uh, Coca-Cola would still be um, destroying aquifers in India, and 25 um, percent of all women in this culture would still be getting raped. And, you know, we could go all down the list. that that. But one of the things that he that 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 did do is it um, it helped me understand it helped me get a framework on which I could start to understand the larger uh, movements of power in the culture and also the the larger ways that discourse supports power. And one of my favorite examples of this is. The psychiatrist R.D. Lang came up with the three rules of a dysfunctional family, which also are three rules of a dysfunctional culture. And rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist. And rule A2 is never discuss the existence or non-existence of rules A, A1, or A2. So what this means, you know, within the sort of corporate news media is you can talk forever about Dancing with the Stars or, you know, whatever spectacle we want to talk about, but um, talking about the things that uh, that really matter, as in the real physical world, or as in stopping atrocities, you know, against women. Um, and so that's one of the ways I think that that, that that's one of the uh, one of the things I got from my childhood, or that I was able to uh, sift out from my childhood or refine from my childhood is that understanding of how abusive dynamics work. Derek, what is the uh, influence of Native Americans in your writing, in your work, in your activism? That's another great question. and. Um, I have tried uh, not to romanticize them, which is another form of objectification. Um, and um, what I do know is I know that the Talawa Indians, on whose land I now live, up in Wayne, Northern California, they lived there for at least 12,500 years, if you believe the myths of science. And if you believe the myths of the Talawa that I lived there since the beginning of time, using a myth as stories that we tell ourselves that make the world fit together. Um, so in any case, the Talawa lived there for at least 12,500 years. And when the dominant culture got there 180 years ago, the place was a paradise. I mean, salmon runs so thick that you could hear them for miles before you'd see them. Um, just, uh, I learned just recently that, that one of the, up in, up in Canada, one of the things that, that people would do for fun when the salmon runs came in is they would throw a little pebble into the water and they would see how long it would float on the backs of fish before it would hit the ground because there were so many fish that the, the rock couldn't make its way down. And, you know, I'm lucky if I see a half dozen salmon in a year at this point. Um, so my point is that they do offer a model for one of the things that that abusers constantly want us to do is to believe that there is only one way to be, which is theirs. And this is true. You know, there's the great line, I think it was Vaclav Havel, um, um, the struggle against oppression is a struggle of memory against forgetting. And one of the things we need to remember is that there have been other ways of living that have been sustainable. You know, the Talawa lived there for 12,500 years, which is sustainable by any realistic measurement. And they didn't do it because they were too stupid to invent backhoes. You know, why? Why? What, what, how did they look at the world differently that allowed them to live? It wasn't because they were primitives. It wasn't because they were savages. What did they have? They had, they had um, 
social structures in place. Derek, you've written, civilization is not and can never be sustainable. Um, yeah, several years ago, I was riding around in the car with a friend of mine, George Draffin, with whom I've written a couple books. And I was just making conversation. I said, so George, if you could live at any level of technology that you wanted, what would it be? And he was not in a very good mood that day, and he said, that's a really stupid question, Derek, because we can fantasize whatever we want, but the truth is there's only one level of technology that's sustainable, and that's the Stone Age. And we'll be there again someday, and the only question really is what's left of the world when we get there. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that any way of living that's based on the use of non-renewable resources won't last. In fact, I would say it takes anybody but a rocket scientist to figure that out. Um, and likewise, it doesn't take someone who's very smart to figure out that if every year there are fewer salmon returned than the year before, that eventually there won't be any left. I mean, there were so many passenger pigeons that they would darken the sky for days at a time. There were six times as many passenger pigeons as all other birds in, northern, in, the northern, in North America. Um, do we know why there aren't any penguins in the Northern Hemisphere? The great ox, they were, they were destroyed. Um, and my point is that um, any way of life that's based on the hyper-exploitation of renewable resources won't last. You have to basically, in the book, What We Leave Behind, what we came to for a definition of sustainability is leaving the physical world in a better place than when you were born. The world is actually a better place because you were born. A lot of definitions of civilization that we see are, are not really very specific. And the definition I like the most, which is defensible both linguistically and historically, is civilization is a way of life characterized by the growth of cities. Once again, defensible both linguistically and historically. And a couple things happen as soon as you, oh, we'll wait, back up. So that's great, Derek, but what's a city? A city I've defined as people living in numbers large enough to require the importation of resources. And what this means is the Taloa didn't live in cities because they didn't require the importation of resources. They um, didn't, um, they, lived, they didn't live in cities, they lived in villages, camps, and they ate salmon, they ate what the land gave willingly. And two things happen as soon as you require the importation of resources. One is that, um, your way of living can never be sustainable because if you require the importation of resources, it means you've denuded the land base of that particular resource. And as your city grows, you'll need an ever larger area. And the other thing it means is that your way of life must be based on violence because if you require the importation of resources, trade will never be sufficiently reliable. Because if you require the importation of resources and the people in the next watershed over aren't going to trade you for it, you're going to take it. And one of the problems with this whole system is that Destroying your land base gives you a competitive advantage over the other cultures who don't. Um, the forests of North Africa went down to make the Phoenician and Egyptian navies. And if you destroy your land base, if you don't care about the future, you can turn this into immediate power and then use it to conquer, And which is something you have to do because you've destroyed your own land base. And um, as time goes on, uh, you have to keep expanding and that's not a very good idea on a finite planet. Derek Jensen, part two of our conversation, coming up later this week, author of Resistance Against Empire, a language older than words, deep green resistance coming soon. That does it for our broadcast. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Sharifa Belkadus, Aaron Mata, Angeli Comet, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar. I'll be in Branchburg, New Jersey tonight. I'm Amy Goodman.